As has been said, I shall be talking to you today on the topic of security, just as billed here, and specifically the issue of making security tolerable. Um, now, I don't know about you, but certainly in terms of my interactions with security, I very often find that it gets in the way of what I'm trying to do. I find that it's not always seeming to operate in my interests, and therefore there are things that could be done actually to make the technology more usable, more understandable, more accessible, but at the same time, making sure that we don't take things too far the other way. There's also arguments against making things oversimplified. And so what I'll be talking about within the presentation today, after a bit of scene setting, um, talking about the issue of difficult decisions that users might face in terms of trying to understand what security wants of them, what it's expecting them to be doing. I'll then talk about some of the ways in which actually as presented to us, the security controls aren't necessarily that straightforward to use. So that section covers cumbersome controls there. And then potentially this problem of oversimplification. So up to that point, I'll be talking about the various things that we need to do to make the technology more accessible, more understandable. But then I'll be saying, OK, you can take it too far the other way. And actually, if you make it too simple, then perhaps it's less useful and perhaps annoying to people on that basis. And then finally some conclusions and we can all go home. Okay, so some, some things about security that maybe you can relate to. Um, so firstly, it requires us to do things that in many cases don't come naturally to us. Thinking about security, thinking about the additional work that it requires is sometimes not the first thing that springs to our minds. And in, in, in many cases, it's actually the last thing that we might actually want to be doing. It's not the reason that we sat down at a computer, pulled out our tablet or our smartphone. It wasn't to have the joy of experiencing security, actually. We were trying to get on with some sort of productive work. And so for security to be there requesting things of us, needing things from us before we can get on with what we're doing, well, I say, perhaps it gets in the way and it, it's not what we were actually looking for. Um, and often when people get down to using security, it's not a very enjoyable experience. There are many things that you can find yourself doing that, well, actually, if you had the choice not to do it, you wouldn't do it at all. Uh, so just for my interest, how many of you have had the experience of finding security a bit of a nuisance in your use of it? Come on, you can, you can be honest. Wait, right, I, I find it a nuisance <laughs> quite a lot of the time, so you, you're with me if you agree on that. How many of you have found it slowing you down, um, getting in the way of what you've been trying to do? Okay, so a few hands there as well. So, I say, at the end of the day, it can fundamentally be, and I, I say this as a security professional and somebody who tries to promote security good practice, it can be a bit of a nuisance. And so, what we're trying to do, or what we ought to be trying to do, in terms of our design and implementation of the technologies and the way that we present it to people, is trying to improve this. So that if they were presented with something like the, uh, this, this thing here, where I saw this at Heathrow Airport and thought it was vaguely relevant, um, how would you rate your security experience today? They can all press the button to say they were happy and smiley about it because it didn't disrupt them too much. Now, one of the things, if we think about people, our, ourselves, in terms of our interaction with security, and getting us to a point where we can engage with it, if you like, as we should do, as the technology would intend us to do, there are a number of barriers or hurdles that arguably every one of us needs to or has needed to overcome. And the first one is our perception of security itself, and our, more particularly, our perception of the, the threats that we potentially face. So are there threats out there and are they relevant to us? And I think the answer in many cases, yes, there are. There are plenty of them. If we think about the internet scenario, for example, then there are actively people out there trying to attack our systems. There's malicious code. There's fraudsters. There are many things that we need to be aware of, as well as the sort of accidental incidents that can occur. So accidental data leakage, etc., accidental loss of data if our systems fail, there's many reasons why we need security safeguards of one form or another. But the first thing we need to get our heads around is there's something that we need to be concerned about. Then the next thing is realising how important it is to us, or ought to be, in relation to other things that we've got to consider. 
So there are these productive tasks that we want to get on with. There are other things we perhaps like to spend our money on. And this could be as individuals or as organisations, if you think of it in that context. So we've got to afford security and protection the right priority in order to then address it appropriately. We've also got to realise, then, that it's our responsibility as individuals to deal with it. It's not somebody else's problem. It's not something that we can entirely say, OK, we know security controls are there, but the system administrator is dealing with that, and I just have to get on with doing whatever I want. We all have some level of responsibility to deal with the technologies ourselves. Then, potentially, there are other issues that we could find that are problems. So if we've got somebody to the point of realising there are threats, security is important and they have a responsibility to deal with it, what we don't want to find is further hurdles that might frustrate their experience. So sometimes you could have people lacking the confidence to think that they, they know what to do, that they, they are actually able to do what they want to provide themselves the appropriate protection. In some cases they will genuinely lack the capability that's required. They might need additional knowledge or technical skills. And in some cases, and this is where a lot of the presentation will focus, we get frustrated by the usability of the technology. So we've overcome all of the other battles, if you like. We've got people to understand that it's important and they've got a role to play. But then the technology they find themselves dealing with actually doesn't support them. It presents security in such a way that they don't understand it or that they make mistakes. And therefore, all the good work in terms of, if you like, cultivating the mindset is lost. What we could also find is that security, the more you deal with it, actually grinds you down. You become fatigued. You become tired of it. And all your good intentions that you might have had at the beginning when you were first introduced to it and the, the, the countermeasures, the safeguards you're supposed to be using, over time, actually just gets too much and you, and you want to stop. And you realise it's getting in the way too much. Okay, so as it says, it's not just disregarding security and not being bothered from, with it from the outset. This is people who, you've got them to the, to the point of thinking it's important and they have a role to play. But over time, they progressively decline in terms of their regard for it and their consequent behaviour. So things, things start off well, but start to go downhill. And so I say that, that adds a further dimension that you've got to realise, and we've got to realise as people providing the security for our users, that this is a situation they could be facing. So I say some, some controls become more demanding, if we think about it, the longer we use them. So passwords, for instance, which I'm sure is something you're all familiar with using, and I'll talk about passwords and authentication as a more specific example as we go on. But passwords, if you're following all the recommended good practice of changing them regularly, choosing strong passwords, having different passwords on different systems, etc., etc., the more you have to do this, the more burdensome it actually becomes. Because the more passwords you've had to, to go through the effort of choosing and remembering, the cognitive demands, the mental effort that it requires from you, is actually greater and greater all the time. So three years down the line, if you've been following good practice, you'll have had tens of different passwords, all very strong passwords, different character combinations, and you might at that point be getting confused as to, well, was it the password that I used last week, or have I changed it since, and which system does this one apply to? And you could find yourself making mistakes as a result, and you start to think, well, okay, if I just left that password as it was and didn't change it because perhaps the system isn't forcing me to, it would make my life a bit easier. Okay? Um, so I say, if you use it correctly, it gets more fatiguing as time goes on. Other controls, so things like backup, are perhaps less fatiguing in the sense that if you've taken the effort to set them up in the first place, ideally, it should just then happen and you don't have to have very many interactions additionally with it. And so there, it's not adding a great deal more demand to you unless a situation arises where you've lost your data and then actively you want to engage with that safeguard because that's where your, your safe copy has been kept. So here's an example of something I would say has been demonstrably fatiguing for, for users on the Windows platform, at least in the past and when it first appeared. And it's a feature called User Account Control, or UAC. Does anybody recognise it by name without me showing a, a screenshot of what it involves? 
Anybody encountered user account control? This is the thing that comes up and appears for you to say that the system wants to perform basically a privileged action and it wants your permission to continue. So the screen fades and this, this dialogue comes to the foreground. And I said, this was introduced originally in Windows Vista and it was very, very intrusive in the sense that any time you were wanting to do something that, in, in a sense, remotely involved installing something on the system, changing a configuration setting, etc., you would find this user account control dialog popping up. And in many cases, it was popping up you know, in, a, in a scenario where it was very obvious that you were trying to do something. So you had done something yourself in the control panel. There had just been a keyboard or mouse interaction where you had changed the security setting. You say, OK, and then the screen fades and up pops this dialog saying, it seems you're wanting to change security settings. Do you want to change security settings? And you're thinking, yes, I do, because that's why I just changed the security settings and said, OK, why are you asking me to do it a second time around? And so people, people who could find the location in the control settings to turn off the user account control might well have been tempted to do that. And as a consequence, they would have been getting less protection. Okay, so I've got a... An example. So this, if you, if you don't recognise it by the description, is what it looked like. Um, and it's still there. It's still there in current versions of Windows, but Microsoft has toned the behaviour down now. So it doesn't now happen as a result of things that you've explicitly initiated via your mouse or keyboard interactions. But at the time, when it was first introduced, there was one interview with somebody from Microsoft where they claimed, or acknowledged even, that, yes, it was specifically introduced to annoy users, to make them more cognizant, more aware of the fact that what they were doing was introducing some change to security. Now, whether that was just retrofitting an excuse for the way that it was basically badly implemented is, a, is another question. But it was recognised, ultimately, that this was something many users didn't like. And if users turned off the control, actually they were weakening the overall security as a consequence. So this idea of security fatigue then, let's think of the different dimensions that might be involved here. So one of them is the effort that the user has to go through in order to actually achieve the security that's required, and that will include how often they're required to do it and what it actually involves them doing. There's also the difficulty of doing whatever they're supposed to do. So the, the effort that it requires of them to actually perform the interactions, but the understanding of the task as well. Um, so you know, do they under, have they got a, a proper understanding of the security task in their mind? And then linked to all of that, or related to that, will also be the importance of the task. So how important do they feel it is to have security for the thing that they're trying to do? And therefore, how much might it be worth suffering the difficulty and making the effort. So we could think of it in terms of some sort of very simple equation. There's, there's something like this. So the, the potential for fatigue will be the product of the effort and the difficulty divided by the importance. Okay? And so if you can measure these factors, and I'm not saying these are easily scientifically measurable, but as a concept, if you keep this in mind, this is something that certainly security officers, system administrators could keep in mind in terms of thinking, well, okay, even though we might not be able to measure actually how difficult or how much effort every different user might do, we can sort of on average guess how much effort it might take for somebody to do this. And we can estimate how important our general user population might think this to be. So on that basis, you can get a rough idea of how fatiguing the security control might be, and therefore how much your users as a population might be getting inclined to reject it or to bypass it or not to use it at all if they have the opportunity not to do so. And of course, even if you're forcing them to do it, if you've got something that is, you know, they can't bypass it, they can't switch it off, even then, if that is how your users or our users, if you like, see security, that's what they think it to be, something that's making them exhausted by it, then it's not going to encourage them to look for security options in other contexts. Okay, so the implications are if they have an opportunity to have a workaround, if they have an opportunity to switch it off, like as I say with user account control for many users, then there's a risk that they might do so. And that just isn't in the interest of our protection. And uh, as I say, it is going to be a factor that prevents people from adopting the good practices we actually want them to have. 
Okay, so as the user becomes more fatigued, potentially the less security compliant they will be. Okay, so they will drift from having perhaps very good security behavior, which is what we want, into something that uh, actually potentially poses a risk to us and increases our, our threat temperature, if you like. So let's think then about some more specific scenarios in which this, this tolerability of security can become an issue. So as I say, three main sections for the remainder of the presentation. One around the sorts of decisions that security often confronts us with. Hopefully, the examples that I'll present here are things that you might have some, some encounter with, some familiarity with, at least in terms of the context, if not the specific applications. Then some of the, the scenarios in which the controls that we're presented with, or the, the actual security mechanisms themselves, are sometimes rather awkward or too demanding. And then this issue of oversimplification. So let's begin then by thinking around this issue of the dialogues and the decisions that we're often required to make at the request of the security measures. So, one thing that I would argue is perhaps useful for users to be able to see is how protected they are at any given point in time. So what level of security have they actually got? And uh, you know, that gives them the, the reassurance to know that security is present, that it's actually operating, and that they can therefore do things with, with some level of assurance that they're protected while they do it. And also to give an understanding of the level of protection. So you don't, in many cases, just want to know that security is off or on, because there are levels to which you might be safeguarded. And so, in those contexts, you want to know, well, have I got high security, medium security, low security, etc. Um, now, that's the theory, and it would be nice if that's the way it was, but in practice, it's often not quite that straightforward to just be able to see things. So you get security dialogues, the interactions with us that are difficult to understand, and decisions or settings that you're required or you have the option to change that don't necessarily make sense. And let's see if we can see some examples of that. So here, it's, a very, it's one of my classic examples that I wheel out of a security dialogue. And this is the latest set of security options dialogues in Internet Explorer, so currently in version 10. As it happens, this interface has looked pretty much the same since IE version 6. Um, and what we have here is the default setting, um, which shows what you would have as the level of security for your internet zone. So when you're browsing on the internet, and you've got this slider control here. Okay, so this is how you can adjust your level of protection. And if we have a look at what it says, and then we'll see if we understand what it means. So there's a slider, and it currently tells, and we understand how a slider works, it moves up and down, it slides, it's nice and graphical. That, that bit, hopefully, poses no problems for us. I've got a couple of colleagues back in Plymouth who I think it probably would pose a problem for, but we won't go into that. Um, let's look at the description. Medium high. Okay, so okay, that gives us an indication of the level of protection. We know that medium high is presumably higher than medium and higher than low, but not as high as high. Um, okay, so we need a bit more description to understand what, what does that actually mean? So, appropriate for most websites, it says. Okay, that sounds all right, doesn't it? We, we understand appropriate, and we understand most. What might be interesting, though, is what are the exceptions. We can't get that from this yet. Prompt before downloading potentially unsafe content. Okay, that also sounds good. And it's going to put up some sort of explicit dialogue. There's probably going to be some difference of opinion if we went around every person in the room about what this potentially unsafe content might actually be. Okay, so what I think is potentially unsafe content and what I might expect it to block versus what you think, each of you, might be different. So our, we need to have some means, ideally, of checking, well, what sort of content is it really talking about? Does this mean malware? Does this mean abusive content? Does this mean pornography? Okay, because certain people's definition of what unsafe, appropriate actually is, is going to differ, okay? Now, certain content would be perfectly safe for me, but wouldn't be safe if I was letting my son on the computer, for example. So, yeah, it's not very precise this yet. Ah, yes, and of course, the, the obvious one, the unsigned ActiveX controls will not be downloaded. So, let's have another little show of hands. 
Who knows what an ActiveX control is? Now, I can't see the middle section very well because I've got this light thing in my face, which I guess is a project. Uh, but there don't seem to me to be very many hands up. Okay? So, we don't know what an ActiveX control is. Do we know what it might mean for an ActiveX control that we don't know what it is to be unsigned? Okay, so a couple of people think they might know. I'll tell you what an ActiveX control is. An ActiveX control is basically active content that your browser could load. So some executable content. It's Microsoft's active component standard for the web. And what it means for an ActiveX control to be unsigned is it's not digitally signed, which means you can't verify the origin of it. That's a basic, it's not exactly technically correct in full, but that's basically what an unsigned ActiveX control would be. Something executable you can't verify the content or the origin of. So perhaps you wouldn't want to trust it unless you knew where it came from, is the point. Now, this is the dialogue, bear in mind, that every end user of Internet Explorer will get if they go looking for security. Okay? This isn't the experts dialogue. This isn't for the advanced users, this is for everybody. And we're trying to get everybody to understand that they need to have security. We're trying to get everybody to understand, ideally, the level to which they're protected. And yet, within this dialogue, we're using, particularly with that third, fourth item, third item, some terminology that we fundamentally, as a group here, don't understand. How many of you are studying uh, computer science? So that's most of the room, I, I say, for the benefit of the camera. So most of the room study computer science, but most of the room don't know what an ActiveX control is. That's, that's not unreasonable. That doesn't mean we're wrong. That means Microsoft, in this case, is wrong for putting that dialogue or that wording into a dialogue that it expects, or maybe it doesn't expect, maybe it doesn't care, but that every end user could get presented with. There's more. <laughs> so if we were to go into the custom level. Now, yeah, by its nature, the custom level rather suggests that you need to know what you're doing. Okay, but let's have a look anyway. So these are the, uh, the custom controls for ActiveX. And things. Um, so we don't know what ActiveX is, so these custom controls aren't going to make a lot of sense to us in the first place. But we have the option to enable, to disable um, these controls, or we can be prompted on each occasion that something happens. So if we don't understand what the thing is, we can be asked the question every single time it happens, rather than just enable to save it. Um, so allow previously unused ActiveX controls to run without prompting. Automatic prompting for ActiveX controls. No, 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 no. There's a, a, allow scriptlets. Who knows what a scriptlet is? Do we want to allow scriptlets? Should we toss a coin? <laughs> See if we're going to allow them. So th this is the thing. So once you get into here, you really do need to know what all the terminology means. Unfortunately, even for the advanced users, there's not actually a lot of help here. There is no context-sensitive help. There's no guidance within the interface. If you go to the help system within Internet Explorer itself, it doesn't explain very many of these things. And there's all sorts of other bits of terminology. There's um, software channel permissions, authentic code, um, binary and script behaviours, all sorts of things that it mentions but doesn't explain anywhere. You've actually got to do a bit of online searching to Microsoft's knowledge base to get answers to what all of these different terms might mean. So even if you're the system administrator, you could find yourself in this list thinking, well, I don't know what the, the best answer is. Maybe we leave it at the defaults, okay, assuming that the defaults are set with a reasonable level of security. Also, looking at it, you don't immediately get an indication of which are the, the settings that are more or less secure. And the other thing, once you've gone in there and you come out again, having changed something, is that this thing that previously showed us a slider, clearly saying that we were at medium high or high security, now tells us we're at custom security. That's not necessarily very helpful. Because that now, and you've probably guessed it, doesn't tell us whether this custom level of security is higher than medium high, lower, intolerably lower, um, whether it's about the same but a little bit different. 
Now we've got no idea, unless we go in, of course, and have a look at all those custom controls that we didn't understand in the first place, we've got no means of telling what our actual level of security is other than it's been customised. Okay? So, there we are. You can go back to the default level quite easily, but assuming it's been customised for a reason you might not want to. Now, within Internet Explorer 6, you'd actually get it going to custom if you just went in, changed nothing, and said OK, and came out again. It would still tell you you were at custom. And also, it wouldn't tell you anything explicit about whether you had set something to a vulnerable setting. Um, sorry, I'll save that bit. If you use a more recent version of IE, so IE 10 includes this, but from IE 7 onwards, it at least does give you some visible indication if you go into the custom settings and start to try and change something to a setting that is vulnerable. So here, for example, when it's been set to something that's potentially risking security, the option highlights in red. If you say OK and you still try to continue with it, you get a dialog box saying, are you sure you want to change the settings to that level because you're leaving something vulnerable? If you say yes, then OK, you come out, but now your internet zone, you see, has got a little red cross on it to say you've left something vulnerable. And if you still say OK to that, then you get a banner across the top of the browser to warn you continually that your settings are putting you at risk and you get an option to fix it with one click. So that's actually good, okay? That's visible security, and that's a step up between what was IE6 and IE7 in terms of making it apparent if you were going in and setting something to a risky level. Okay, but all of the rest of it, all the lack of explanation, all the use of terminology that we don't understand, is actually, it's been the same since IE6 and possibly even before that, just the interface was a bit different in earlier versions. Okay, other ways in which the, the dialogues can be a bit of a pest. Um, sometimes, uh, and I've got three sets of them, so the first set is unwelcome dialogues, things that you didn't really want to have to have. So, for example, um, it, this isn't to say they're unnecessary, but it does, what I am saying is they're getting in the way, they're interrupting what we're trying to do, and very likely we've already pressed an OK to initiate an action, and then we get another thing just because of security. So here, a couple of them. One, the user account control, um, which I mentioned earlier. And notice here, you started this action, um, if you started this action, security center, um, do you want to continue? You know, well, I was doing something in the security center, so yes, I did want to do this security-related thing. Um, this one up here is just installing something in terms of an update to Acrobat, I think, in this, or Flash Player, rather. And it's prompting me then for the administrator password, which, okay, you don't want the system just to arbitrarily accept um, software updates without confirming it's being done by an authorised person. But nonetheless, I'm sat there as the authorised person having to do this additional thing to keep security happy. Okay, I'm not saying it's not necessary, but it is unwelcome in that context, because it's just another thing I have to do. Here, we have, and again, this is it's still unwelcome, this one. Um, this isn't necessarily unnecessary either, but this one is uninformative. Okay, so this, this is, okay, the, the context in which this occurred might give you some information. So if you had this appearing over the top of a web browser and you knew where you'd gone to, you might have some understanding of why it happened. But just look at the dialogue on its own and see what it tells us. Security warning. Okay, so security is to blame for this, is the first thing I, I understand. Allowing active content, such as script and ActiveX controls, which we don't know what they are, can be useful. <laughs> oh, that's right, be useful. But allowing active content might also harm your computer. <laughs> are you sure you want to let this file run active content? <laughs> well, well what, what active content is it? What's it called? Where does it live? What's its name? Um, <laughs> Have you got a picture of it? Would I, would I know it if I met it? Um, what's it trying to do? No information about anything there, other than it is some sort of active content, which presumably the, the application you're currently active in is trying to run, and you just have to do that toss a coin thing again. Yes or no? What's your risk appetite? Did you really want to be doing what you were doing at the time? So in which case, no, yes, I want to do it because I was trying to do something I wanted. 
Or are you now very scared because it's a security warning and you say no, and then you can't do what you were trying to do? Okay, now, either of the responses might be the appropriate one, but we really don't know from this dialogue. And unnecessary dialogues. So, you can try this particular one if you, if you use something like Microsoft Word. This is when somebody has password protected a document, but they've not password protected it, so you need a password to be able to read it. This is the password you need in order to be able to modify the document. Okay? Now, this pops up the minute you try and open the document, or always used to on Word. So, as a user, having received a document, you get confronted with this. Okay? And it says, the document is reserved by administrator in this particular case. Enter password to modify or open read only. You don't know the password. What do you do? Okay? What do you do? Okay, how many people would email somebody back and ask for the password? Now, I've already read the dialogue out to you, so you've probably already queued onto the, the key thing there. How many people would click the open read only button? Okay, because that's the one you would need to do, actually. You have this button here, read only, which if you don't know the password and you only want to read the document, you don't want to modify it, you can just press that button and open it then. The thing I would think here, and why I've underlined it as unnecessary, is all somebody has done at that point is try to open the file. Why do you need to frighten them by asking them for the password at that point? If they try to change something in the document, or they try to save the changed version of the document, then ask them for the password. Why not, if you've got to say anything at all, put up a dialogue box just at the start and say, you won't be able to save changes to this document without a password. You just say, OK. You know, just so they acknowledge that that's the case. Asking them for the password causes all sorts of confusion. Okay? And you can try this. I say, if you do this, I almost guarantee that you will get people who email you back and say, I don't know the password. Can you tell me the password? Okay, and you can you know, then email them back and say, no, you don't need one, you just read only it, because it says it there twice in the dialogue. Okay, but people get blinded to that by the fact they're being asked for a password. Okay, now this other one here, this I think is from uh, possibly Word on the Mac or something like this, and what it's ha what's happening here is I'm trying to create a PDF version of a, of a document, and I don't want anybody to be able to uh, copy the content of it at all, basically. I don't want them cutting and pasting things out of that document. In order for me to have that feature, it is insisting, again, it's passwords here, it's insisting I set a password. Okay, so require a password to copy text or images of the content. What if I don't want anybody ever to be able to copy that content? I just want to create a document in which they can't copy the content. I don't want them to, to be able to do it if they have a password, because I'm not going to tell them the password. So all I'm being asked to do here is create a password and type it twice, just for the sake of it. I don't need to remember this password, I'm never going to use it again, but I have to go through the process of creating it. And I have to think, well, I, I want to create a strong enough one that somebody's not going to be able to crack it, because I don't want them copying the content. Okay. I just want the box that lets me create the file in a protected mode and doesn't ask me for a password. If I wanted to share the thing, I'll, I'll have a separate option for that, thank you. But no, I've got to create a password. So security is asking me for something again. And the number of times I do this and find that I don't type the two passwords in properly and I end up having to do it again and again and again. I, I waste hours a day doing this. Um, okay, so one of the things that we've done as part of our research at Plymouth University is trying to think about ways we can simplify this for users. Recognising actually that, well, some of you sat there might have thought, well, look at that that he's talking about. I understand that absolutely. I'm just not putting my hand up to make it look like I know everything. And others of you are thinking, well, actually, perhaps I don't understand even what was on the, the thing when he said it was simple. And so what we want is a means of presenting security in a way that matches the users that it's actually being presented to. So, one of the, the recent projects we've had is one that we've, we've created this architecture and prototype called Automated Security Interface Adaptation, which is a very nice acronym there. And the idea of this is, 
It allows an interaction with the user to see what do they understand. And if they don't understand something, they can give feedback to the system to say, actually, that bit doesn't make sense. So later encounters with the same sort of dialogue could embed more help in it, could give more indications. We're still not going to turn a total IT novice into somebody who understands how to use Internet Explorer's custom settings. But what we can do is try to supplement and enhance certain interfaces that perhaps don't make sense to lay users, or in some cases suppress things that more experienced users don't need to see every time. Okay, so a, a, a small example of how this might take an existing style of interface and change it. So we've got the original here, before adaptation, and you can see what it's doing, it's giving a security warning to somebody opening a file, but it's not necessarily giving as much information as a, a novice user might want. So what we've tried to do on this side is to give a little bit more information. So we're saying, for example, what we perceive the risk level might be, which could be based upon feedback into the system from prior users and prior encounters with a file of a similar name, etc., and guidance that for common, frequently asked sort of questions. So what is it? Um, what's the risk? What should I do? What did others do? So you can get community feedback into this. So if 90% if of people decided that they were going to run the file and they never had any problems, then you're probably quite safe with that decision. Well, you might wonder what happened to the other 10%. But if 90% of people say everything seemed OK, perhaps you're confident then to proceed. So this is the sort of thing that can be done to make the dialogue a bit more meaningful for people. Okay, so this is something we've done some early prototype work with, with one of our recent projects. Okay, so that was one set of problems. Let's move on to another set, come to some controls. And the control I'm going to pick on, because I've been picking on it already, is that of passwords. And uh, you're probably, you know, to some degree, familiar with this sort of issue, that you have many different things, devices, services, applications, that need a password from you. Okay, so here are just a small selection of the things I use and use on pretty much a daily basis that require me to offer them a password. And uh, some of them are websites, some of them are things, operating systems on the, the systems I use, encrypted USB keys, things of that nature. And of course, I'm following good practice, I have a different password on every one of these, ish, um, and I change them sometimes. Um, and perhaps I don't do all the good things that I should do, and certainly, you know, if you're a student of the topic, I'd say you should do, but you know, people don't in practice, because it's actually quite a nuisance to have this and many more things to have to deal with, and to manage all the passwords distinctly for them. Okay, so you take some sort of value judgment about what are the things that you most want to protect, and you perhaps apply the good practice well enough with them, but, you know, so for example, this one here right behind me, it's a um, password uh, login thing for the journal that I edit. Yeah, nice journal, don't wish it any harm. But you know, if somebody else wants to log in there and edit the journal for me, I'm not going to be quite as concerned as if somebody logs in or knows the password to my encrypted USB kit. So I'm, I'm a bit more concerned about the password on that one. So my practices might vary. But as I say, this is the thing with passwords. that. Every aspect of good practice that you're advised to take with them makes them actually more difficult to use. So you've got to select good passwords, strong passwords in the first instance. So that requires you to use all different character types, make them longer, etc. Makes them more difficult to type as well, makes them a bit more difficult to remember. If you've got to change them regularly, well, that's something different you've got to remember then each time. You shouldn't reuse them on multiple systems at the same time. You shouldn't go back to old passwords you've used in the past. You know, it's, a, it's a challenge to your memory all the time to come up with new wonderful ideas. And you shouldn't write them down because then somebody else could find them. Now, okay, there are workarounds to this, so one thing that I do is I store reminders about my passwords on my phone. Okay, my phone itself is protected by a decent level of authentication, so somebody would have to get into the phone and they would also have to have the reminders that I've written down make sense to them in order to compromise the passwords. I don't write the passwords themselves down, but I do write reminders that will make me think actually what they were. 
Okay, so the fact we have to deal with multiple systems makes it even more difficult to manage because we've got to do all these things on all, well, theoretically, all the different systems and devices we utilize. And you can use password management tools, but then you've got the issue of having to have access to them. So, um, you know, you've still got that step of retrieving them. So, okay, when I come across a site or service I don't use that often, it does take me a couple of minutes sometimes to track down the entry I've left somewhere on the smartphone and work out what did that reminder actually intend to remind me of. Now, we have um, indications that there are quite a lot of passwords for people to remember. So, um, just off the bottom of the screen there, but this is from 290 respondents that we asked um, very recently um, in a survey with Plymouth University. Over a third of them have more, 16 or more passwords or password protected accounts or password devices that they have to remember. So that's a, a fair number. And you see very few people, only 10% have between one and five password protected things that they have to think about. So passwords are very much with us. They're very much a, an established control and we encounter them increasingly because pretty much you know, a lot of the websites now want us to create accounts on them. Not necessarily for security actually, but because they want to track us as users. So they want us to log in so they can see what we've done. So we still need a password to protect that account. Perhaps it will be a password we don't care so much about because it's not protecting anything that we're worried about, but we still need to have it, we still need to manage it. And we asked these respondents also, well, what were their password practices like? And, uh, well, in some cases you'll see there's some fairly reasonable responses, but there are some gaps in practice. So we picked the, are there at least eight characters long? Now, I'm not saying eight characters is a good minimum but it is pretty much the best minimum you find on a lot of websites. So some websites will happily let you get away with well, actually one character passwords. Many of them, like Twitter, I think still um, requires a six character password as a minimum. Google was one of the better examples when I laughed at, requires at least eight characters. So we use eight characters as a sort of almost best practice minimum on the web. So 82% of our response, we asked them to think about their most important password protected account. And 82% of them said they had at least eight characters in that password. So 18% of them still don't. Does it have alphabetic and numeric characters in it? So most of them there, 89% said yes it does. So remembering or understanding that the more character types you have in a password, the more permutations an automated password cracking tool would need to go through to find a match. Does it include other characters, so punctuation symbols, thus making the character space even more rich? Now here, far fewer people, 52%, so just over half. Okay, so what we would really like to see is at least eight characters, alphabetic, numeric, and special characters within the password to, to have something that's reasonably robust. Does it use a word you would find in the dictionary? Here we don't want anybody to have words you can find in the dictionary because these password cracking tools or password auditing tools, if you give them to a system administrator, they have a pre-cracked or pre-encrypted list of dictionary words. So if your password is one of those, it will just be found like that. Okay, no brute forcing, no trying permutations, it's just found. Is it based upon personal information about you? Now, we don't want that, because that's the sort of thing that, well, actually, people who know you might think you might use as your password. So using your pet's name, brother's name, sister's name, address, car registration, etc. don't do that, because people who know you could try it, and people who engage you in casual conversation could quite easily get that information from you through social engineering. So if, you know, if we were to have a chat outside, it wouldn't take long for each of us to have a conversation in which we find out, oh, what's the name of your, oh, you've got a brother or sister, what's, what's the name, how old are they, where do you live? And we could gather all this information quite easily. Okay? People are good at doing that if they've got an objective in mind. And so we see 20% of people are still using that sort of information. Have they ever changed it? Only a third have done that. How many change it regularly? Not that many. Um, have they shared it with other people? That's where our respondents seem to be pretty good. They seem to understand, in the main, that the password is meant to be a secret, and they don't share it with other people. Um, have they ever forgotten it? So have they had the inconvenience of using the password themselves and, and then not remembering it, having to reset it? Yeah, about 12% have had a problem. So it's not an ideal method. We don't use it very well, and lots of people have problems with it. But uh, why do passwords continue to exist so prominently? Because they're actually quite 
an easy to apply technique. They work on many different types of system, types of device. Doesn't mean they work well, but you can use them. Okay? So be it a desktop system, be it a laptop, smartphone, tablet, you can have a keyboard of some sort on it and therefore you can enter a password. Okay? But it doesn't mean it works well, as I say. So if we think about mobile devices, think about your smartphone. How many of you have any sort of in, uh, authentication on your mobile phone? So a PIN, a password, a something to protect your phone. Not a huge number. How many of you, which it applies, have a password? Not a, not a number, not a PIN, but a password of you know, sort of alphabetic and numeric characters? One, maybe two people. Okay? So not that many of us. And one of the reasons here is that actually it's a bit of an awkward thing to enter. So I'll give an example. So let's look at what it involves to enter an 11-character password on an iPhone-type device that's got alpha, alphanumeric and special characters in it. So here's my chosen password. I wouldn't say it's a great one. Um, I wouldn't advocate you using that password, but it does comply with good password practice. It's long enough, it's got alphanumeric and uh, whatever in it. Um, so that, that O is a zero there. Um, and it's got the special characters, it's got, you know, the dollar symbols. But if I was to enter that on the phone, I need to go through the normal alphabetic keyboard, the symbol keyboard, and the numeric and symbol keyboard, changing between them trying to work out which character set I'm going to get up and how, where I need to be in order to enter the characters that the password needs. So something that I could type maybe in less than five seconds on a, on a normal uh, laptop or desktop keyboard could take me maybe 30, maybe longer seconds of fiddling about on the phone trying to get the right character set up on the keyboard. Okay? So you know, it, it's quite irritating. And for a device that you know, is in and out of your pocket all the time, you, know, you, you want to do quickly something like it. It's not like where you sit down at a, a, a desktop system and you might expect to be there for 10, 20 minutes, an hour, or whatever. This is in and out of your pocket all the time. You don't want to go through this sort of hassle. So the compromise solution we often find is people will use a pin. Okay, It's better than nothing. But the standard option of a four-digit pin, when you think about that, four digits, a thousand combinations there, as against the alphanumeric special characters parcel, which has got you know, millions of combinations, very often protecting the same data. Okay, so you, you've got your data on the desktop, and you, you realise I've got to have a strong password. You have the same stuff on your smartphone, which you're carrying around, which you could drop, you could lose, somebody else could take, and you're actually putting less security on it because it's not convenient to have the same level of protection as the device that's not likely to get lost or stolen quite so easily. We also get scenarios like this, where with passwords, because they're a pain in the ass to use, the technology realises that, and it asks us, do we want the system just to remember the password for us, so we don't have to worry about remembering it? It takes, it takes the effort out of it. But of course, it completely undermines security if that system is one that somebody else has any sort of access to. And how many of you have been in a situation where you've maybe used a, a public system in an internet cafe or a library or somewhere else or somebody else's system, and this thing has popped up, and you've inadvertently clicked the wrong option? You say, do you want to remember the password? Yes. Oh, no, I don't want to remember the password. It's not my system now. <laughs> and now I've remembered it on somebody else's. How do you get it to unremember it? And you find yourself spending quite a bit of time trying to find out how to get this bloody system now to forget the password that you've just told. You just remember it for me. Okay, so this, this can be quite dangerous for security. It's good for usability because we now can forget the password. But that's not necessarily so good if we ever have a scenario where we need to remember it again. You know, this actively encourages us to forget it. So a recent thing that Apple have introduced on the, on the Mac and iOS platform is something called the iCloud Keychain, which takes this concept and allows you now to remember your password in the cloud and share it across numerous devices. So again, it's, it's actually good from the usability perspective. And it's actually also good in the sense that the, the iCloud Keychain can also suggest for you appropriate strong passwords for you to save. So you don't even have to think the password up. It will suggest a password, and you can then save it to the cloud. So anytime you then access a particular site, your iCloud keychain will populate the password for you. So it's all well and good, provided you still retain access to your iCloud account, etc. But it does 
rather change the practice of passwords then for us in terms of how we have to interact with them. It now encourages a culture of not having to remember them. Okay. Good for usability, not quite so good for security. So again here, just as an example here, I've come across a new password, new opportunity to create a password, and it's offering to, you know, it's created that password for me as a suggestion, and if I accept that, it will then save that to my iCloud keychain and my iPhone, my iPad, my Mac, will all be in sync any time I go to that site, I don't need to remember the password, it will be pulled from the cloud. Okay, very usable, nice, but, you know, perhaps not quite the way that we originally meant to be interacting with that security, but it does try to make it more usable. It can also remember credit card details for you, but it doesn't at least remember the credit card verification code. You still need to have that in your mind. But of course, certain sites, they need to be seen to be going further than standard password authentication. If you are dealing with something like your online bank or something else that's got very sensitive account details, you want to see, I would suggest, something more than a standard username and password. You want the feeling that that account is well protected. So here's an example from um, Barclays ING Direct service in the UK. Um, and what you have here, after you enter your surname and your, your account, your, your user number, you then have to go through this process of providing selected digits from a secret number and also a memorable date that you've told the system. And you enter them via this on-screen keypad, so you don't type them on the keyboard because that's intended to avoid key logging, that malware might be enabling to capture you at your keystrokes. And you notice that although it looks like a numeric keypad layout, the numbers aren't in the normal positions. Okay, they're, they're randomly distributed around. So the next time we do it, actually number three might not be there, it might be up there. Okay, and that's to prevent screen captures and mouse movement loggers. Okay, so it's all there to have a stronger form of authentication. But from our perspective as users, this is now involving a much more time-consuming interaction. So we can't just type the password like many of you might be able to do in just a couple of seconds and press return. We've got to think about this. This will take us probably 30 seconds or more at least to go through the process if we've got all the information to hand. If we can remember our security number and therefore mentally go through and say, okay, digit one is such and such, digit three is five, etc. And you know, you've got to watch what you're doing here. It's not just the automatic all, it's always going to be number nine in the top right hand corner. You've got to look where are the numbers I want to click on. So it's more cognitively demanding. <coughs> okay, so I, I basically said that. It's, it's more of a challenge for the legitimate user. Now, there's a good reason for it. Many users will tolerate the additional effort because they realize they've got something they want to protect. But this sort of thing won't scale for websites in general. Would you want to go through this sort of process for every website you've got an account on? I'd say you probably wouldn't. And in some cases, they go to an even greater extent. So here's an example from HSBC Bank. I don't know if they do this globally, but certainly in the UK, every HSBC customer has been issued with something called a secure key device, a little keypad. It's about this sort of size. And what you do now when you log into the online banking, you have a similar arrangement to the ING Direct thing where you've got to have your, your number, um, your banking number to begin the process. But then you go through and you ask for a, a secret name, and then you've got to give <coughs> the, the one-time code that gets generated by this device. So you go from your on-screen online banking to the little device, press a button on there, type in a PIN to authenticate yourself to the device, it will then give you a time-limited, about 30-second, six-digit code, which you then go back to the browser and type in to complete your online banking login. So it makes it more secure. You've now got to be in possession of this device. You've got to know the PIN for that device and the, the, the secret information that the website asks for in order to masquerade as the user. So again, tolerable enough, perhaps, if you're the, the legitimate user on a banking site, but this won't scale to every other type of site, not least because you don't want to be carrying loads and loads of these tokens around. So now, anytime you want to access your online banking, you've got to have this with you, which is perhaps less convenient. Okay? Now, moving beyond that, there are other methods that we could go to. Instead of passwords, what can we have instead? So passwords are a pain. Having tokens 
it's stronger but we can't do it for everything. So are there other methods that we could use that make it easier? So one thing that we've done some research on is around graphical methods. On the basis that people find it easier to recognise and remember images than they do to remember an arbitrary string of characters like we, we saw for the passwords just now. So particularly if you present something that they can recognise rather than having to precisely recall from memory, then it helps them to interact with it. So there are various things you can do with graphical methods. You can have things where people have to recall a sequence of images in the correct order, ideally. Perhaps they have to pick out secret points within images. And sometimes you have things where they have to draw something. Sketch a secret, for example. OK, so here's one that we did back along at Plymouth, something we called pass images. The idea here, and we use it for logging into websites and to mobile devices, is people have to remember a sequence of six everyday objects in the correct order. Okay, now there were not just these objects, you had different grids, so you could cycle through, I think it was up to three or four different grids of images. And mentally, you might construct a story for yourself around, uh, okay, somebody had a cup, and in the cup they, they put some water, they boiled in the kettle, and you, know, you could construct something that helped you to remember what your images were. And then when you saw them, you would click on them in the right order. Okay, so that's one approach, remembering things in the right sequence. More recent stuff that combines a couple of techniques actually quite usefully and gives the user a choice about, well, do they want to remember a sequence of different images or do they want to remember hotspots, secret points within the images, is this one, the Enhanced Graphical Authentication System, so another of our PhDs. And this one, in this particular case, we've got four images and one of those images will be one of the secret images of the user, for example, and they have then secret points within it. And they go through a series of these in order to log in. And if you're the right person with an image you recognise, you will hopefully remember that, ah, oh, that was the image, and I picked those points within it. So it's easy enough for you to go in there. Somebody who isn't you, hopefully, is more challenged by that. Now, this is one that you might have encountered yourself because this is in wide or widespread distribution at least. How many of you have got Windows 8 at all? Okay, a few of you. Have any of you used Windows 8's picture password facility? Okay, not, not so many. So what this allows is a, a particularly useful for the, the tablet touch devices that Windows 8 can run on is instead of typing a password, you can have an image, so it's just one picture, but then you have three secret gestures within the image. So you can have a secret point, a line that you draw between two points, you just swipe along the thing, and you can circle an area. Okay, so again, what it requires you to do is to sort of remember on the image that you've got, well, what did you use? Did you use three circles? Was it a circle, a line, and a, and a point, as I've got there? Was it just three points? So you've got to remember the gestures you had and the points in the image to which you applied them, which is perhaps okay if you use it regularly. What I found, I must admit, the first time I set one up and then went back to it a few days later, thinking it was going to be oh so obvious to me, was I couldn't remember what the hell I'd done. Um, and so I had to revert back to the password to unlock the picture password and reset it. But on regular day-to-day -day use, this could be quite straightforward, okay? Because it's something you can do just like that, and you're in, okay? And as long as somebody isn't observing you too closely, that's reasonable enough. What you could find, of course, if you hold a tablet device up and look at it in the light, is smears where people have gone and drawn lines and drawn circles, but that's something you have to clean your screen every now and again. And this is another one that's a little bit similar. How many people have got an Android device and use Pattern Unlock? This is a bit more popular, I'd imagine. So this, again, graphically gesture-oriented. So here the idea is you've got a secret line that you draw between multiple of these points. And you, know, you, you just do that and you, you unlock it. Now, the thing with this is, a bit like the previous one, it can be quite observable. So if somebody is holding up their device, and this isn't an Android device, but you, know, you get the idea, somebody holds it up and they go through it like that, and you, you just see their hand move, you can tell I'm probably doing something that's going from the top of the screen diagonally down to the bottom. And so watch them enough, even from behind, you might get an idea. Take the device, actually, and look at it, and, the thing, and you can see, if they've got greasy fingers, you can see lines that they've left. And actually, this, as I always say, was the first encounter I ever had with 
pattern on lock was with some students, and uh, one of them, his phone was quite protected. He, he had pattern on lock on the phone, so he felt quite safe to go off to the toilet, leave this phone on the table, walked away. Other student that was with us picked up the phone, looked at it in the light, saw the greasy finger marks that the previous one had left on it, unlocked the phone, and then changed the pattern on lock pattern. So the other one comes back, does it, and it doesn't unlock for him. And he's, he was quite confused for a period of time. Um, and so that was a, a, you know, a fairly immediate demonstration that this only works well under certain circumstances. So the protection actually might not be as strong. The usability, though, is possibly better than having to remember a pin. But you've got to then take that compromise. Another thing on Android. <coughs> Apologies for the... Uh, the, the face that I've got on there, that's one of my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Clark. Some of you in the audience know him, and so I do apologise. Um, <clears throat> this one, the idea here, is that basically, phone's got a front-facing camera, you just pick it up, you look at it, and the phone unlocks for you when it recognises your face. Now, the slight problem with this one, particularly in the way it was first implemented on Android, and this is where this picture's taken from, it's from a video of us demonstrating this, what we're doing in this particular context is not showing the face of the user, we're holding up another phone with a photo of that user on it, and the Android phone is unlocking. Okay, so there was no liveness detection in that first implementation. What they've done more recently on Android Jelly Bean, for example, is you have to blink to unlock the phone. You have to show that you're a live user, not a photograph. But the way that you can get around that is if you have a photo of the legitimate user and cut eye holes in it and then bleed behind it, or if you have the picture on another device, have an animated GIF of that user with a blinking on it. You just you know, edit the picture, put skin colorization over the eyes in one image, alternate it to one that's got the eyes open, and it blinks. And uh, so I say, that, that still can be bypassed. But as a technique, unless you're doing it in the dark, this is perhaps quite a usable technique for unlocking your phone. It's a biometric now, not a, a secret-based thing. And most recently on, um, on Apple's iOS platform with the iPhone 5S, they've introduced a fingerprint scanner. And this time I will turn the phone around because it's actually an iPhone. Um, and so you've got a fingerprint scanner built into the home button. Now, let's just see if I can do it. If I just put my finger on there, and it unlocks the phone. So now I don't have to remember the passcode, I just have to do something that's fairly natural. You know, as, a, as a user, you're used to pressing the, the home button, so just resting your finger on it and it unlocks the device. Okay, so that can now be used to unlock the phone and also to confirm purchases on the iTunes store, on the App Store, on the iBook Store, etc. So it's made it more usable. But still, if your fingerprint authentication fails, it drops back to using a passcode. So the passcode is still seen as the thing that provides more security because the biometric isn't considered reliable enough to be a full replacement yet, but it is more convenient, particularly if you think about the number of times you take the phone in and out of your pocket. So we've done some more stuff around this as part of our research. So looking at mobile devices more generally, so this is a slightly older style of device, but I use it just for the reason that on this one it did have a fingerprint scanner in it, and we didn't want to use that because it required in those days a specific action. So you had to swipe your finger over it rather than just put it on the button you would naturally be using. So here what we did, it's got a touch screen, so you can do signature recognition or gesture recognition using the stylus. It's got a microphone, so you can do voice verification. It's got a keypad, so you can do keystroke dynamics, authenticating people by the way they type. It's got a camera, so you can do face recognition. And through the general use of the device, the applications, data, services used on it, you can profile that. So we did a prototype implementation fusing these different techniques together. So depending on what the user's doing at any particular time, you can have non-intrusive, transparent authentication for them. So it doesn't require them to do anything other than normally use the device. And it will take from whatever they're doing, whatever authentication feeds it can. Now, if the confidence isn't high and it needs you to explicitly authenticate yourself to do something more sensitive, then, of course, it can still interrupt you and do that. But for normal use, it tends to simplify the user interaction. 
And this is something that we've taken even further in a concept we've called the authentication aura, which is recognizing that, of course, we have multiple devices. So I keep sort of pulling this smartphone out and, and showing you that. Now, I've just authenticated myself on that phone using a fingerprint, which I would argue is a fairly strong sort of authentication. If I now go over to my laptop, which is in my bag, it will ask me for a password, which I would argue probably isn't as strong as the authentication I've just done on the phone. So wouldn't it be nice if my phone could actually give some confidence to my laptop that the phone has just seen me authenticate strongly? We're actually in quite close proximity, so if I go over to the laptop, does it need to ask me for the potentially weaker password, or should it just let me use the device because I have this aura of authentication already around me based on what I've done on the phone? And if I've authenticated on the phone and on the laptop, should my tablet want something separate from me? Okay, so get the devices to interact together using different strengths of mechanism, and you can have some overall measure of how confident they can be collectively in the user. And so we've done, as it says on the slide, a simulation um, using 20 participants and their daily activities, measuring how often they're in contact with their different known devices. And what we've simulated is that, based on 1.23 uh, million interactions we've captured, you could reduce the number of explicit authentication requests by about 75%. Okay, so it makes it much more convenient. Okay, so finally then, in terms of the, the topics, this issue of the, just a warning about taking things too far in terms of simplifying them. So everything I've said so far is technology is too complex, it requires too much of us. So now let's go the other way. Okay, so sometimes if you make it too simple, you can make it less useful. Okay, that's a, a fundamental fact. So sometimes users want to have control. They want to know more detail of what's happening. And if you make it too simple, it can become frustrating for a completely different reason. So here's something that I use on my Mac. I use Intego's Virus Barrier. And this is the interface I normally get presented with. Now, I'm a Mac user. I use antivirus internet security because there uh, isn't a big malware problem on Mac, but there still could be. And there are other internet threats, so let's have some protection nonetheless. And this is the interface it gives me. It's a very flashy looking interface. It's got my big green glowing thing in the middle of it, which tells you what it's scanning. It's got little dials here and little counters and a graph and everything moves around and it looks all very involved. Okay. And I was using this and going to update the signatures, as you do, to make sure it's got the latest threat signatures on it. And I noticed it was offering me something different. It was offering me Internet Security 2013 for free. Now, I'm an academic. I spot free. Free is good. Okay? Uh, you know, you're not going to get something free past me without me noticing it. And, of course, I've got Virus Baron. This is Internet Security. This is a, a more full package, I'm thinking. Let's have it. It's free. Okay? So, um, it includes dramatic improvements in product usability, performance, performance and enhanced experience. It sounds like just like what I need. And that's what I got. Okay, so it looks okay initially, let's not panic. It's got a picture of a computer that actually looks a bit like mine, and it, you know, it's got some buttons there. Um, but then I found, actually, I can't do much with it. Okay, it tells me I'm connected to a network, it tells me things are going in and out and that some things are running, but that's now all it tells me. Where's my little graphs and my little dials and my moving things gone? I mean, I didn't think they were very useful at one point, but now I've lost them. And I suddenly realized they were giving me something useful sometimes. Particularly this bit, and if you're a Mac user, you know in the top right-hand corner you get all the little status indicators. This thing up here, nothing security related about it actually. This was a traffic monitor that previous version of the software gave you. Let me see what was happening in terms of network activity. How much was I uploading and downloading? Very useful when you connect to a Wi-Fi network and you want to see if it's actually doing anything. And now I didn't have it. And I almost cried. Because that was the one use, you know, I don't get malware on the Mac, to be fair. I've never had a warning that the system's infected. But I quite like that little traffic monitor. And now I don't have it. And this free upgrade has taken something away. But it's made it more simple, because now I don't see the information. And I've, I've lost my graph. I've lost my little dial that went <laughs> when things were happening. I don't know what it was measuring, but it looked good. Um, and 
and more particularly, if I, if I delve deeper into that original interface, yeah, you could see what it was measuring. You could see on all the different ports the level of activity that was going on. You could see in the logs quite a lot of detail about when things had happened. Now in this new version, I had nothing. I knew if it was on, I knew if it was off. And I didn't like it. So I took it off the system and put the old version back on. But that was an example to me of how it was a much more simplified interface. I mean, if I was my late mother, I would have loved it because, you know, I, you know it's, it's green, it's all happy, I don't have to look at anything else. But me, I wanted to know some of these things. And so I say, the, the simplification was actually not very helpful at all. And that's something we need to bear in mind. Basically, we're not all the same. Some of us like the technical information, some of us don't. And some of us will want it at different points. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all. So at least having this customizability is going to be useful. So, some conclusions off the back of all that. Obvious statement, but sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Security is meant to be there, basically, for our benefit. That's the key point. We should feel like we're benefiting from it. It shouldn't be something that gets us annoyed and upset and frustrated. I say this, nobody uses IP systems just to experience security. There are a minority of people who can get medical help that do use IT systems just to play with the security. Okay? They normally catch them and, and they, they give them treatment. But most people don't use systems just to see what security it's got available on it. They're trying to do a productive task. So if you put it there in a way that gets in the way, it's going to be a problem. Okay? It doesn't have to be difficult to use. There are ways it can be made straightforward. The, the use of fingerprint on the iPhone 5S, I think, is a very good example. It's the first time I've seen fingerprint recognition put on a device in a way that feels really natural. So on that previous mobile device I showed you where you've got to scan your finger explicitly over it, you know, you're never normally putting your finger in the top left-hand corner of that device for anything. But on the iPhone 5S, it's scanning exactly where you would normally use it. Okay? It's really easy to do it. Um, as I say, giving proper consideration to the design enables those sort of benefits to come through. Just having the security options there isn't enough. Think back to the Internet Explorer example. It's got plenty of options, but do we understand them? No, not really. Okay, so we need to have them there in a meaningful way. You need good default settings, and IE arguably has good defaults, but the fact is there are things you can change and some people are going to want to, so you've got to be able to allow it. And you need to cater for the novices, you need to cater for the advanced users. So I say, having that nice little slider, little label of low, medium, high, that's good for novices. Having the custom things, that's good for advanced users. But even there, the lack of help for the advanced users, you know, are they that advanced? And the terminology there, facing the novices, that's not really a good match. So it's not really clear what the, the target user for an interface like, say, IE security options really is. And finally, some contact details. So an email address, if you wish to contact me afterwards, Twitter thing, if you're into that sort of thing, and the URL of our research centre, which has got details of our projects and various publications and things that you can download there. So, thank you very much indeed, and I'm happy to take any questions.